All right, so today we're going to tune up y'all, jaw, y'all, all y'all, one of those. We're going to tune it up. Okay, just like before, we need to get some step responses on the yaw axis, so we're going to go up. So make sure when you do this, you do not have angle mode turned on, because if you have angle mode turned on, uh, if you have any feed forward or anything like that, uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> straightforward plenty of samples let's go take a look at the log so in Betaflight 4.0 default PID values for y'all have changed also the multiplier in the background for y'all has changed as well so whenever you're looking at the y'all axis here this log shows the default values for y'all so it's P of 35 and I of 100 the 100 the integral term is actually multiplied by 2.5 so really when we're putting 100 in there the I gain value is really 250. So a lot more emphasis is placed on I for controlling yaw. It was recognized that yaw is really fundamentally controlled by the momentum shifts of two propellers. So if you wanted yaw left or right, it'd be like motor one and motor four, or motor two and motor three, and those would spin up or spin down to really make a momentum shift in the weight of the prop and the motor bell and that's what gets the yaw move started. Fundamentally, yaw is a much slower access than the pitch and roll because there's really no thrust component. Again, it's just momentum. So tuning of yaw is a little different. Historically, we don't have a D term. And if you look, yaw is very slow to react compared to pitch or roll. So the D term is really just too fast of a term regardless. And it really just adds noise into the system you don't get any overshoot with a high P term or a high fee forward value for y'all. So if you don't have any overshoot issues, you don't need a D term. The D term is great for when you have overshoot conditions that you need to control, but also the D term is very sensitive to noise. So if you don't need it, you don't want to introduce it because it brings along the baggage of introducing noise. Obviously we do need the D term on pitch and roll. So we're going to accept that baggage, but for y'all, since we don't need it, we're not going to use a D term. It is there in beta flight, so you can use the D-term on y'all if you so fancy, but I don't really recommend it. Um, but if you do some logs and you see otherwise that there's some benefit to having a D-term on y'all, I'd be more than happy to look at that stuff. It'd be very interesting to me. So this log, again, we're looking at the defaults of 35 and 100 for what the user interface has for proportional and integral. Again, just in the background for beta flight 4.0 and up, this integral is really multiplied by 2.5. So if you are taking some 3.5 PIDs that you just are in love with, uh, the integral for yaw you'd have to divide by 2.5. So on the defaults, just going up and doing our stepped moves, so I'm trying to look at the step response of the PID controller for yaw moves, you can see here I have the set point which we're trying to track and then also the gyro. So we're trying to really make the gyro follow the set point. We're on the UAV tech trace setup number seven if you are wanting to follow along and see the same things I'm having here on the screen. So one thing we haven't talked about yet, and it's a nice way to bring this in, is this PID error. The PID error is really what gives you a good representation of what the P term is reacting to. So the P term is not going to react at all until you have a PID error grow. So the P term really is reacting to this error. As you can see right here, the gyro is not following the set point right at this spot when we first enter the move. And that's why this PID error grows. Now this would flatline so you can see it gets a little bit more and then it starts to go down and you can see that represented here same thing it kind of peaks out right at this spot for pit error 
and then it starts to catch up and go down. So again, the, it's a nice way to represent, you know, what an ideal quadcopter really has is zero pit error all the time, or as minimal as possible. You're really trying to find on roll, pitch, and yaw that this pit error line, either in trace setup seven, eight, or nine, really minimizes down, or trace setup number three, which just looks at pit error on all three axes with having the P, I, and D so you can kind of see everything in relation. It is important to note that Brian White's PID toolbox has a pit error analyzer where you can compare the pit error of two logs, and that's why it does. So if you're saying, hey, this setup flies, you know, this firmware is flying better, or this, these PIDs are flying better than other PIDs, you have to have similar flights. That's the tricky part. But if you have similar flights and characteristics, same wind conditions, same moves as close as you can, then you can compare those logs. Whatever had Celeste Pit Air is the better flying quadcopter or better flying setup on a specific quadcopter. So looking back at this, you can see I have a lagging limb here and descending limb where I'm just not tracking uh, set point very well. So when I look at this, it's the same thing to me as the roll and the pitch access. When I'm seeing I'm not following on the step up, to my, you know, basically my step response, that means I need more P term. I need more of this pushing term, this red line here to get y'all to follow that or feed forward. And you can see on the descending limb, I have a lot of pit error here as well. And I term starts to accumulate. So I'm gonna actually start to get some I term bounce back. You can kind of see it right here where I'm going down below the set point. That's I term induced bounce back. If I keep looking at this, you can see here, this bounce back, that's I term induced. Here, this bounce back again, this is not anything other than the I term is accumulating too much here because we don't have enough P term pushing it to closely track set point. Whenever you don't have enough pushing term to keep you on set point, I term will start to accumulate. Now some might think, well, I'll just go to I term relax and set it to R, P, and Y to include y'all as well. But that would be a big mistake. Y'all does rely heavily on the I term to keep it tracking, to push it, around because it's just such a slow uh, axis to control. There's not a lot of authority there, so you need a lot of I term to kind of balance it out and keep it tracking. So if you, you go ahead and try it sometime, just keep the defaults, set this to a roll pitch and Y, and you'll see y'all is hardly, it has any uh, stepping move. It's gonna be really, really slow, not responsive. The set point tracking will be even worse. Um, so it's not a good idea. You can probably, it's just interesting to try if you want to. So that is definitely not the solution of using iTerm Relax or setting that to roll, pitch, and yaw. We would always just keep it to roll and pitch. So the only other solution is really to get tracking of set point even better. And like I mentioned before in the feed forward video, if you have your gyro tracking your set point close enough, you don't need iTerm Relax because you won't have iTerm wind up on any of the axes. And that's really the best goal. So now let's look at a log where we set the P term to 80 and kept the I term or integral at 100. So really 250. And you can see in this log, we have better tracking of the set point. We're closer here and we have a little bit less I term wind up. And you know, we don't really have any bounce back here because we have a stronger reaction to the P term. So as we move the stick out, this pit error grows and there's a harder push to close this gap on the pit error. That's what the P term does. So we're really trying to push back against this growing pit error with the P term, and we're trying to keep a still a high uh, integral term or I term so that once it's you know getting up close to set point, it holds that. It's just kind of how the flight dynamics for y'all work. And you can see we really don't have the bounce back condition nearly as much. Uh, we have a pretty close tracking here. Um, this, is, this is pretty good. So the next thing I think is, well, if P at 80 looks pretty good, let's go up to P at 200. And why 200? Well, you can't go higher than 200 on the P term. And you can see here our yaw tracking is, again, pretty good. It looks about the same, maybe a little tighter than at 80. Uh, we can see kind of the pit error here. We have some growing up here at the top. This is where uh, right here, it just couldn't keep up. So it kind of uh, jumped out through here. The you know, you're kind of looking at this line in, in relation to what we were looking at before. The higher these are off of the zero line, the more pit area you had. It's a little easier to visualize than looking at this gap in between here. So you can kind of scroll through here and, and see how that looks, and that looks pretty good. That being said, you can see the ascending limb, though, we're still not exactly on the gyro. And that really highlights, again, the issue with just the pit controller alone. The P term only pushes against pit error. 
So you have to have pit error for it to push it all. So you will always have a gap if you're trying to track set point with just the P term alone with a standard PID controller. Again, brings in the importance of something like feed forward, which pushes based on your stick movements and it doesn't need PID error. It doesn't need any PID error up here to start to implement a push. And that's why feed forward is introduced, recognizing kind of just that fundamental, like why do we need PID error to grow first, then to start pushing it? Why can't we just push it based directly off the stick inputs? So in this log, we're looking at the P term of 100, the integral of 100, and then a feed forward of 125. Now we'll browse out through this and you can see a little closer tracking. We still have a gap. I could probably go higher on feed forward. Doesn't look like we have any bounce back on this uh, and go through. And at the end of the day, I'm trying to convey the fundamentals of what you're going to do and look at. I'm not saying that this is the best tune for this and nobody could do better on this quadcopter. Sure, you can play around with values some more, but honestly, I get to a point where I'm like, that tracking's pretty tight. I'm happy with it. I like how it feels. I'm good. I'm not gonna sit there and try to perfect the irrelevant. This little bit of a gap in here for the pit error, uh, I'm really not worried about. Honestly, the big thing I wanna do with all these quadcopters is I wanna get onto Betaflight 4.1 where the feed forward was improved so there's not this up and down jerking anymore it's interpolated feed forward forward has a more consistent step response uh, for feed forward so you don't get this hump up and down and essentially get these humps here as well the humps are coming because the rc signal is is humped it's just feed forward magnifies that it's kind of like the d term magnifies the slope of any gyro noise well feed forward really magnifies the slope of the RC input. So when you see really jagged uh, lines here because of feed forward, it's because your RC input's really jagged and it's just magnifying that again. But nevertheless, for Betaflight 4.0, uh, I feel this is pretty good for this quad. Hopefully with this, you can see kind of my process of you go through to tune out yaw. And you can see obviously the, the betterment we've made here on the yaw tuning from the default. My advice for the yaw tuning is it's a pretty broad window because it's so sluggish to move that it's not this nitty gritty. So if you just wanted to plug in your proportional of 100, integral of 100, and then a feed forward of 100, 125, or 150, I think you'd you know see if you like it better. If you don't, then obviously go back. But um, that seems to be the close, uh, much closer default or setup for tracking of yaw set point. All right, that's it. As always, thanks, and I hope this helped.